climate change activist Greta Thunberg heads to Vancouver, but why is she turning down Victoria? This is CBC Vancouver News. He chose to move Canada forward. Our work is not over. Canadians are counting on us. Make sure we serve the people, Canadians. Holding the feet to the fire. There will be crispy toes. Left with a weakened grip on power, Canadians give Justin Trudeau a second chance. But what can we expect to see from a liberal minority government, especially here in B.C.? Good evening. To get anything done, the Liberal minority government will likely need help from at least one of the opposition parties. But cooperation on issues like the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion could be hard to find. Last night, in the riding where the pipeline meets the sea, voters re-elected the Liberal candidate. So who might the party turn to for help on the controversial project? Valpuri is in Burnaby North Seymour tonight. When it comes to debate about energy and the environment, this is ground zero. In the riding of Burnaby North Seymour, there's complexity around the way people feel about the expansion of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I don't think it's a good thing. I don't see the justification of um, the future money into it. I do look more at the environment and how important that is to everybody. So it's a risk. For me, that's a big issue. I mean, I just don't want the... I don't think we need that pipeline coming through BC, especially coming through Burnaby. I'm pro pipeline. Yeah. Okay. So I vote conservative. Even though it's going to get built, the Liberals are going to build it. They bought it. So build the thing, get it over with. And with that, voters here re elected Liberal incumbent Terry Beach. In 2017, he was one of two Liberal MPs who voted against a motion in support of the pipeline project in the House of Commons. Prime Minister gave me one job, which was to make sure that Burnaby North Seymour was Liberal. We accomplished that tonight. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'll take a look at the bigger picture. Last year, the federal government bought the pipeline for $4.5 billion in order to keep the project alive. Opponents to the project thought that would play to the benefit of NDP Sven Robinson's attempt at a political comeback. It didn't happen. I have been opposed to Trans Mountain. I will, be continue, I will continue to be opposed to it. And I want real action on fighting the climate crisis. I'm going to fight for those things. The NDP, according to this political expert, has enough votes to prop up the Liberals, but will have to face some hard choices. Do they try to demand action on their various priorities like uh, 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 drug care, like uh, student loan relief, like affordability for housing? Uh, are they going to prioritize those ahead of the pipeline issue or is the pipeline issue going to be a, a line in the sand? They're going to have to make some decisions. Clearly the Liberals can't do anything by themselves. They have a minority, but a strong minority. And issue by issue, they can afford to work with the others, the NDP, the Greens. And when it comes to the future of the pipeline, the Conservatives. The plan is to twin an existing pipeline from Edmonton to Burrard Inlet to allow the export of diluted bitumen offshore. But the election outcome hasn't changed the B.C. government's position on oil projects. We intend to continue to do everything we can to ensure that, uh, that within the law, within our jurisdiction, we protect B.C.'s interests in both the environment and the economy. Experts say it will be a negotiation, but don't expect the Liberals to walk away from their pipeline plan. Bell Puri, CBC News, Burnaby. A liberal minority government is welcome news to some, including the regional chief of the B.C. Assembly of First Nations. He says this type of government is the best result for Indigenous people, an opportunity to move forward in Parliament. If you look at the uh, political platforms, there's a, a lot of support for First Nations and uh, Green Party and, and NDP. And, and to some extent, the, the Liberal Party and their platform to uh, have First Nations uh, address First Nations issues. Okay, it went from an orange surge to an orange crush to the NDP losing nearly half its seats. And now there are questions about the future of Jagmeet Singh's leadership. Arlie Ann Young explores how much of a role race may have played in the party's disappointing results. It's the morning after, and Jagmeet Singh's voice is still hoarse from weeks of campaigning. All right, good morning, everybody. But the first-time federal party leader is already facing tough questions. What happened to the much-anticipated Singh surge, and... Are you concerned that people may be questioning your leadership because of that? Oh, not at all to the second part. Uh, to the first part, you know, we, we are really proud of where, how far we've come. 
Early polls showed Singh and the NDP coming in fourth or even fifth. But as the days wore on... You do not need to choose between Mr. Delay and Mr. Deny. Singh's popularity jumped. But that surge fizzled at the ballot box. The NDP lost 20 of the 44 seats it had going into the election, dropping to fourth place, overtaken by the Bloc Québécois. But despite all that, this political science professor says Singh campaigned well. I think there will be some casting blame on uh, preparedness and, and how well he is, but maybe he's now demonstrated that kind of electability or that likability. Bayer says Singh lost support in Quebec, where secularism runs deep, and Singh's identity as a turban-wearing Sikh may have had a role to play. We should cut the turban off. There is racial discrimination that exists in our in our country, systemic, in a systemic nature, and real, if you want to... If we want to do something about it, we can't just talk about uh, the anecdotal things that happened to me, for example, but I, I want to commit to real change. There is racism, there's no question. How much it had an impact on the election, it's pretty hard to say. I would say strategic voting in the end had more of an impact than racism ever did. Whether Singh's ethnicity affected election night results is up for debate, but pundits agree he'll likely get to do it all over again in four years. I think you have to leave them in place. The party, the party, the party needs to have a conversation about, about its future, but I don't think that a leadership campaign is the way to do that. I think he'll have another election to run. I don't think he's going anywhere. And if it's not him, Singh's historic run as the country's first federal party leader from a visible minority may have paved the path for others. I hope that a lot of people were inspired. I hope a lot of young kids saw someone that looked like them or someone that went through similar struggles as them and now can dream bigger. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. For its part, the Green Party is celebrating an historic win on the East Coast, but at the same time, dealing with big disappointment here on the West Coast. Last night's election results now have Elizabeth May hinting at an exit strategy as leader. The CBC's Tanya Fletcher is in Victoria looking at what's next for the party. We have more than doubled our popular vote and we tripled our seat count. You can hear optimism in her words, but disappointment in her voice. We can make a really significant contribution in a minority parliament and we will. A more subdued leader celebrates her party's first MP elected outside B.C. Jenica Atwin's victory in Fredericton also giving the Greens a distinction inside the House of Commons. We enter Parliament as the first caucus in the history of our Parliament that is two-thirds women. It's a party trying to find the silver lining after another election where it failed to meet expectations. The Greens themselves had grand ambitions of sweeping Vancouver Island, but in the end they made no gains here, instead simply hanging on to the two seats they already had. I think it just goes to show that a barrage of negative advertising, uh, advertising has an impact. I think it's a sad conclusion, but I, there's nothing else that happened in the campaign that could explain Vancouver Island. The leader of BC's Green Party doesn't disagree. So much of it was a smear campaign, one candidate over another. And I think, you know, in, in, in Canada, British uh, Canadians need to, you know, push for a better rhetoric in our discourse. Regardless of who's to blame, the Greens failed to fully capitalize on what became a marquee election issue climate change. A party devoted to the environment was not able to leverage the momentum generated from recent global climate strikes. Elizabeth May's name has become synonymous with the party she's led for 13 years. But now at the age of 65, she's hinting her time at the helm may be coming to a halt. I think as a result of this election campaign, we have many more uh, people who could see themselves as leadership, in leadership roles. She insists she's not making any immediate decisions as long as there is a precarious dynamic in Ottawa. If the government falls in the next few months, the answer is yes. I will lead my party into the next election, depending how long this minority parliament serves. Throwing open the doors to a succession plan with no obvious successors in sight. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. It's creating a big buzz here in BC. Fresh off the heels of her visit to Alberta, Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg is making her way to Vancouver. CBC's Dan Burrett joins us now live. So Dan, what do we know about why Greta is stopping here? Well, uh, the group Sustainability says Thunberg is coming to town for another climate strike this Friday 
outside the Bank of Art Gallery just up the street. And it will be her 62nd. When an estimated 100,000 people hit downtown Vancouver for a climate strike in late September, Greta Thunberg, as you can see, noticed and praised participants on Twitter. She was in Edmonton last week with thousands of other people marching in Canada's energy heartland. She told the crowd their future is at stake. Before that march, Thunberg met with Liberal leader Justin Trudeau during the federal election and told him he's not doing enough to protect the environment. You can bet Greta will attract quite a big crowd here. No doubt, Dan. So Greta has also been invited to Victoria, but she's declined that offer so far. Why is that? Fossil fuels, Anita. Victoria Mayor Lisa Help says she and other mayors invited Thunberg to Victoria for a climate strike, but heard through another councillor that's been in touch with her people that she said no because BC ferries would have to burn fossil fuels to get her there. Since then, though, someone else has made quite an offer. Take a look. Former Canadian Olympic rower Adam Creek has offered to row Greta from the mainland to Victoria and back so she can attend the island climate rally carbon free. But we can all pull together to, to tackle this climate change thing and we can all take actions and, and move forward in a positive step. Uh, and I think uh, inviting Greta over is, is, is something that's very positive. It's a very uh, you know, uplifting idea. We'd love to. Now, if Thunberg does accept Adam Creek's offer, it would take hours to get her there. We know the Georgia Strait is a long way. Keep in mind, BC Ferries is planning to launch six hybrid vessels, and the first could be sailing by next year. The CEO says they have a long-term plan to electrify the entire fleet, but that's years away. So if Greta does say yes to Victoria, she's also been invited to speak at the BC legislature. Anita, Mike? All right, Dan Burt for us live tonight. Thanks, Dan. More unsettling testimony today at the trial of the man accused of murdering an Abbotsford senior secondary teen three years ago. A psychiatrist testifying that Gabriel Klein heard voices before stabbing Letitia Reimer in the hallway of the school. As Jason Proctor reports, those voices told Klein to kill. Gabriel Klein stayed silent for four days after the stabbing of 13-year-old Letitia Reimer, even as he was committed to Surrey Memorial Hospital under the Mental Health Act. When he did finally speak, it was to emergency psychiatrist Dr. Samantha Safi, who was on call on the night of November 4, 2016. Klein told Safi that he had stolen a knife that day and went to the Abbotsford Library, which was connected at the time to the high school where Letitia Reimer and her friend were studying. He told Safi he saw the girls and then he squinted his eyes and saw what he thought were monsters. And then he got up and walked towards these creatures or monsters. But the psychiatrist said there were also inconsistencies in Klein's descriptions. And she said... I wondered if Mr. Klein was specifically seeking a mental health diagnosis in order to support an NCR defense. Klein has since indicated that he intends to argue that while he stabbed Reimer, he should be held NCR or not criminally responsible because of mental disorder. Safi said his claims were inconsistent. He said he heard voices saying, kill, 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 but later said he didn't. He asked if tainted drugs had made him psychotic, but later said he didn't think drugs had played a role. Klein has since been diagnosed with schizophrenia, a fact Safi appeared unaware of. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Vancouver. Homicide investigators are in Chilliwack tonight after a man was found seriously injured downtown. Happened near Yale Road and Fletcher Street just after midnight. Police were called about an assault with a weapon near a car wash. When officers arrived, they found a 27-year-old man who'd been shot. He was taken to hospital where he's on life support and not expected to survive. This young man was known to police, and this appears to have been a targeted shooting. There is no indication that there is a risk to the general public. One of our IHIT teams is now in Chilliwack and is working with the detachment's serious crime unit. They'll be working to gather evidence both from around the crime scene and the surrounding area. Anyone with information is asked to call police. A big development tonight in an exclusive CBC story. The RCMP has decided not to proceed with new allegations of conduct against an RCMP inspector from Chilliwack. Inspector Suki Manj was cleared earlier this month after several allegations of abuse of authority when he was the head of the detachment in Lloydminster, Alberta in 2016. 
He had been accused of mishandling a romantic relationship between an RCMP dog handler and a civilian officer manager. Uh, they were both under his command. Munge and his wife, Corporal Tammy Hollingsworth, were both suspended with pay in 2017 over the matter. Though he was completely cleared by an internal board, he was told the RCMP would be resurrecting allegations previously dropped. Both Manj and Hollingsworth have now been cleared of all allegations against them. Hollingsworth is back at work, but Manj is still off. A coroner's investigation has determined a faster medical response could have saved the life of a man who died at a Richmond trampoline park. 46-year-old Jason Greenwood was fatally injured when he did a front flip into a foam pit at Extreme Air Park last year. The report found none of the three staff members working that day were trained in first aid or had been instructed on how to respond to an emergency beyond calling 911. Greenwood was in the foam pit for more than 20 minutes before firefighters removed him. His death prompted calls for the province to begin regulating trampoline parks. We're getting a better picture tonight into how a woman was dragged down Hastings Street by a van for several blocks earlier this month. A 24-year-old woman suffered life-changing injuries after getting stuck underneath the van. Police confirm it now looks like the victim walked between the van and its cargo trailer when it was stopped in traffic. The driver didn't notice the woman was pinned under his car until he pulled over and stopped. An American man in his 30s was initially taken into custody but has been released and the investigation is ongoing. Brett's here, first check of the forecast. It stopped. <laughs> it actually stopped. Did it? it did. The rain, it stopped. <laughs> it was a full seven days worth of rain. We all got through it. Started off this uh, week. I mean, certainly yesterday was a very rainy one. As of right now, though, our look at the satellite and radar imagery, well, there's no use for the radar. It's just a few clouds that are coming in all across the region. And that's going to be mostly the trend for the overnight periods, but some really good news. If you've been just dying to have the sun come out this week, this is definitely going to be the week for you. It is going to be making an appearance fairly regularly throughout much of this week. In terms of our current temperatures, bang on seasonal all the way across the region. Largely 11, 10 degrees or so. A little warmer into the valley in general. Very much where we should be. And what are we going to be doing for the next little while? Well, I think tomorrow you're going to be needing some of those sunglasses. I actually forgot mine today, but this was an inconvenience that I was happy to have for once. Through the remainder of the overnight period, we're going to see the lows go down to about 7 degrees or so. Tomorrow morning, first thing we're going to be seeing a mix of sun and clouds and still a little bit on the cooler side but by the afternoon very seasonal day so 12 degrees or so is where we should be at for this time in October and we're going to definitely get there with just a mix of sun and cloud and then once more those clouds are going to be returning in the overnight. I do want to mention though it was a little bit gusty today and that's still going to be the case as we go through the overnight some northwesterly winds across the Strait of Georgia but aside from that it's going to be a pretty nice week. All right Brett thank you. You're welcome. The BC Human Rights Tribunal has ruled against a transgender woman who filed complaints saying she was refused waxing services by more than a dozen salons. Jessica Yanivs accused the salons of discriminating against her. She identifies as female but has male genitalia. Today, her case has been thrown out. The Human Rights Tribunal calling the complaints disingenuous and self-serving. The ruling also found Yaniv misled the tribunal by being untruthful and engaging in extortionate behavior. Yaniv has been ordered to pay $2,000 to each of the three respondents. Just a reminder, you can watch this newscast on CBC Gem. The app is free, and you'll also find other CBC programming there. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, not a single Liberal MP was elected in Alberta and Saskatchewan last night. And that has the term Wexit trending on social media. Why it's more than just a hashtag, next. Thanks so much for joining us tonight on our regularly scheduled commercial break and our online programming. An 80-year-old country singing grandmother may be the most popular person on the east coast of New Brunswick. Now she's been delivering mail for three decades there, and as we hear from the CBC's Kate Lederick, her advice for staying young is keep moving. It's a typical day for Lucy Johnson. 
She's busy delivering the mail along her 74-kilometer-long postal route in Kent County. Johnson started 32 years ago and says people are usually happy to see her coming. Some of them are just waiting for me. <laughs> they want their mail, I guess. Especially if it's a check? Yeah, yeah. When the check comes in, they want, a, they want their check, yeah. Johnson knows many people her age are in retirement homes, but that's not in her plans. She says it's important to find something you enjoy doing. It keep me younger, uh, not getting... If you're sitting at home doing nothing, it's not uh, very good, so as well keep on going. Johnson's other passion is country music. She plays guitar, sings, dances, and fills her weekends with music. Johnson also has a wide circle of friends, including Leah Robichaux. <laughs> oh, she's a real good friend to, to talk to, have fun, laugh a little bit, and uh, joke with her, and <laughs> we always have fun. The two have been friends for 25 years, and Robichaux says Johnson is a familiar face around town. When Lucy goes by, there's Lucy, the mill lady, they call her, and oh no, she's really, uh, I think it's, it's working and keep her going all the time, yeah. Johnson has five children, six grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. She survived a bout of cancer and still stacks her own wood for the winter. Her secret is simple, just keep going. Just get moving, don't stay sitting, doing nothing. <laughs> the, the more you move, the better you feel. That's what I learned. <laughs> Johnson says she won't be slowing down anytime soon. She plans on delivering the mail for at least the next couple of years, and that makes for a very special delivery. Kate Lederick, CBC News, Rishabukto. A couple yeah. more years. I mean, why not? Well, sure. And can... in uh, Rishabukto, they get all kinds of nasty weather in Do the they? winter. Oh, yeah. 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 Part of New Brunswick that. Uh, She'll be going through the snow and the sleet and all that stuff. Well, she's an experienced driver, That's apparently. Right. She's the mail through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, we'll be back in just a few moments with what's making headlines across the country. Okay, now that the election is over, the Liberals have to figure out how to make government work with a smaller caucus. And as David Cochran reports, Justin Trudeau isn't the only one facing the challenges of a shrinking team. The morning after the election, the crowds are a lot smaller, and so is his government. <laughs> Justin Trudeau will face a divided parliament, but a parliament that leans left. And senior Liberals say advancing progressive issues is the path to making it work. That may start with the newly diminished Prime Minister finding common ground with the newly diminished New Democrats. Well, everything is on the table. Uh, I can say that much, that we are not ruling out anything. Uh, but we're not going to negotiate that here. Singh already spelled out his conditions for support during the campaign. The parties can likely come together on issues such as pharmacare, housing and student debt. But Singh has very practical reasons to keep this parliament alive. Over three elections, the NDP has plummeted from official opposition to the fourth party. Their historic breakthrough in Quebec broken by the bloc. The party itself is also broke. Its fundraising has lagged behind the others. It mortgaged the building it owns in downtown Ottawa to pay for this election. It can't afford another one. We're going to continue to build on that support. We built up a strong foundation and we'll continue to work hard. So there is a path for Trudeau to work across the aisle. The path to filling his cabinet is less clear. Historically, every province gets a cabinet minister. But the wipeout in the West cost Trudeau key ministers in Amarjeet Sohi and Ralph Goodale. And two Canadians in Alberta and Saskatchewan know that you are an essential part of our great country. I've heard your frustration, and I want to be there to support you. But how to support them isn't clear. There are no Liberals to replace them in Alberta or Saskatchewan. 
The historic option of appointing a senator may not be an option, as Trudeau kicked the Liberal senators out of his caucus years ago and has been appointing independent senators ever since becoming prime minister. It's a handcuff of his own creation, just as voters have added some new restraints. David Cochran, CBC News, Toronto. Well, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a catchy new hashtag that's popped up in Alberta. Wexit. Yes, it popped up last night. As Carolyn Dunn explains, it speaks to the frustration in that province about feeling left out. To say people in Devon, Alberta are angry today is an understatement. The perspective among most here is the country has again voted in a government that is hostile to oil and gas, dismissive of the province. But I am ashamed of Canada. I'm ashamed of Canadians right now. I, I think right now there's a lot of emotion and passion. Um, personally, I, I'm not going to stop the fight. I took my Canada flag down this morning in my backyard. Hashtag Wexit was trending on social media. That stands for Western Exit, by the way, even though it's driven mostly by Albertans. It was catching on fire on talk radio, too. Oh, we're, we're not fitting into this confederation at the moment. I think we're going to really be talking about a, a serious crisis in unity in this country. This political scientist wonders if all this talk could lead to a change in Alberta's political landscape. Do you see an Alberta first type party um, that says, you know, we're not going to separate, we just want the autonomy that the Quebec is advocating? In the short term, Albertans are trying to understand the impact on the oil and gas industry and its pipeline projects. What's going to happen with the pipeline, whether it sits, sits un, undeveloped or if it gets sold or if it gets developed improperly. Yeah, people are pretty shaken up, I think. I definitely do think they need to pay more attention to the West. I think people get pretty upset about the fact that the votes over East count for so much more. But it's not all gloom and doom. The reality is Canada is a great place to be and we take our lumps. It's only four years. We'll figure it out and move on. Four years at the most. No matter how long the government lasts, plenty of time for anger and a growing sense of frustration to dissipate or fester. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Well, a lot of talk of election and results, but what does it all actually mean for you? The Liberals, of course, made promises throughout the campaign to try to make life more affordable for Canadians. The CBC's Peter Armstrong is looking at how some key promises might become reality in this new political landscape. Even this minority government will have a major focus on your pocketbook. One key Liberal platform promise would cut taxes for Canadians in the lowest tax bracket. They say the measure will pull 40,000 Canadians out of poverty and save the typical family $585 a year. The Conservatives had a similar policy, so the government should enjoy support. The Liberals will probably push ahead with promises to lower cell phone bills. And the details are vague, but the Liberals vowed to cut bills by 25% within four years. You are sending our Liberal team back to work, back to Ottawa with a clear mandate. We will make life more affordable. And that just snowballed. It's easy enough to find common ground. Both the NDP and the Liberals had plans to give a break to those with student loans. The NDP promised to remove all interest on federal student debt. The Liberals promised to increase Canada's student grants and give students more time to repay those loans. Both left-leaning parties promise to create hundreds of thousands of new childcare spaces. I'm hoping that uh, Mr. Trudeau respects the fact that there's a, a minority government now, which means we've got to work together. Politics can be ugly and divisive, but hope always seems perched on a not-too-distant horizon. The majority of MPs in the House of Commons support the basic idea of a national pharmacare program. Trudeau made some vague promises toward implementing Pharmacare. It would be unwieldy and immensely complicated just to get support among federal parties. Then the government would have to negotiate a deal with the provinces. And if you think the Commons is divided, just look at the political map of this country right now. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto.
Well, more than one million students from elementary to high school also voted yesterday in mock elections across the country. And while they would have also elected a liberal minority, that's where the similarities end. A dead heat with the Liberals capturing 110 seats. The NDP with 99 would form the official opposition. The Conservatives got 94, 28 for the Greens and 9 for the Bloc. But if you just look at B.C., the proportions change significantly. In fact, the Liberals capture zero seats here. 24 went to the NDP, 10 to the Conservatives and 8 to the Greens. Her design was pulled from a shoe contest. Coming up, why a Toronto teen who was in first place is now out completely.
Toronto teen says she's disappointed. Her design was pulled from a Vans shoe contest. Her online entry represented the unrest in Hong Kong. The grade 12 student was in first place before Vans removed it. The CBC's Talia Ricci sat down with the teen who wanted to conceal her face to avoid any possible repercussions. Well, right now I'm working on watercolor. 17-year-old Naomi So says art helps her feel calm. When she was considering her design for a Vans shoe contest, she chose a theme that was close to home. My dad and mom, they've been keeping up with uh, Hong Kong news. From that, like, I started getting interested. And then where did you get the inspiration for the design? I was researching what Hong Kong citizens wore, and a lot of it was uh, gas mask, mask, helmets, umbrellas, which are all symbols of this impactful event in history. And there's a red bohemia flower, which is the Hong Kong city flower. Her entry skyrocketed in votes. Naomi was on track to win. Definitely really surprising and excited. And I couldn't imagine going from 300 votes on second day to going to more than 200,000 on the fourth day. How did that feeling change when you saw that your design had suddenly disappeared? I just think that it was the taking down my design was disrespectful to the freedom of expression. Vans responded to Naomi after she reached out asking what happened. They also released a public statement. It said, in part, as a brand that is open to everyone, we have never taken a political position and therefore review designs to ensure they are in line with our company's long-held values of respect and tolerance. They may have had public relations in mind when they made the move because they're trying to avoid controversy, but I think um, the net result is going to be probably worse controversy than they than they would have had otherwise. This associate professor of business ethics says Vance should have found a way to make a compromise to honor the votes and her talent. I realize they don't want to be putting forward something that's politically controversial, but they should have been able to find a way to to you know honor the commitment that they had at least implicitly made. Uh, fine print aside. Naomi says she has been receiving messages from smaller companies that want to collaborate and a lot of support. I think it's important for artists to express through their art because by developing something beautiful for others to relate to and engage in is very important in this day and age because some feelings are not easily expressed through words. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the CBC's Go Public team has been investigating online banking fraud, and there's certainly no shortage of stories there. More than 200 people have reached out, including a BC man who had his bank account hacked and thousands stolen. As Erica Johnson tells us, there are calls for banks to take more responsibility when their systems are compromised. It felt surreal. Like, I mean, you can, no one wakes up thinking that, hey, money's going to be taken out of my bank account. Last February, hackers targeted Sanjeet Lidar's savings account, stole $3,000. While he was sorting things out, standing inside his branch, they grabbed 2000 more. I didn't feel safe at all, wondering, well, what could I do now? Uh, money's gone and uh, no one's there to help me. Scotia Bank refused to reimburse its customer, said the money was transferred from an IP address Lidar had an extensive history with, although cybersecurity experts say hackers can do that. Cyber criminals targeting bank accounts are a growing threat, according to a security advisor with an international team of investigators. Banks have been fighting it for a long time now, and uh, it has been becoming increasingly challenging for them because criminals have become increasingly sophisticated. She helped uncover malicious software, recently shut down, that targeted North American financial institutions, including two Canadian banks, stealing an estimated $100 million from customers. As more bank customers lose their savings to hackers, this public policy researcher says it's not their fault. The bank should be required to take responsibility. How does it make sense to blame the people who are using the tool that's given to them and are then victimized by the tool? We didn't build it, we're told to use it, and the persons or groups or organizations that are building these tools have to accept liability for their own failures. 
Go Public asked the Canadian Bankers Association whether the banks would consider paying out when their systems are compromised. The CBA wouldn't address that question, saying protecting customer accounts is the bank's top priority. After Go Public contacted Scotia Bank, it reimbursed Sanjeev Lidhar. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. 21 minutes ahead of uh, 7 o'clock on this Tuesday evening. A live shot of downtown Vancouver tonight. Finally, finally a day without rain here on the south coast. And it may not be back for a while. Brett's forecast is next. Dozens of families have been forced to flee as flash flooding turned the streets of a northern Italian town into a river of mud. Fifty families were forced out of their homes near the water after torrential rains caused the river to burst its banks, flooding neighborhoods and creating havoc. Vehicles were washed away and at least one driver was killed. It's the second time in a week the region has been battered with high winds and heavy rain, making it one of the country's wettest autumns ever. Yeah, I, we had a lot of rain, but not... Uh, Definitely not that. that much. No, not to that extent, but I feel like maybe it matches the sentiment of feeling like maybe one of the wettest autumns ever. Mm -hmm. Got some interesting stats for you. We are right where we should be for Vancouver. It's you crazy. mean normal? For rain, yeah, oh, for the month of October. I was expecting October. you to say we're... Off, off the, the charts, charts. Yeah. Yeah. and that's it it's funny because that's the perspective that we have after a week of all of that and i mean this morning if you were giving a look out to try to see the sunrise it actually happened it was a little bit later than usual in terms of when the sun finally broke through the clouds but just about 10 o'clock or so after those fast moving clouds moved on through well look at that almost pure blue sky once again hello old friend it has been a while but it was a welcome sight you may be wondering though over the past seven days because really it has been officially a week since we've had all of this rain how much did we get in that time well vancouver international airport 93 millimeters of rain 40 of which fell yesterday alone many places like west vancouver squamish and port alberni even cracking well over that hundred millimeter mark what i was alluding to earlier in terms of where we should be for rainfall the october normal 
normal for Vancouver is 121 millimeters. And with everything that we now have to date in October, 118, we are just three millimeters shy. So suffice it to say, we can turn off the taps. We are good to go. And I think largely this week's forecast is going to be able to mirror that. Throughout the overnight period, I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's going to be on the cooler side. We're seeing some clearer skies pulling in throughout the overnight. Down toward New West, Burnaby, Richmond, and Surrey, we can see into the mid single digits, while closer to Vancouver will be about seven. And then tomorrow afternoon, widespread temperatures are going to be right around 12 degrees. So here's how the rest of the week, though, is going to be playing out. You can see largely not a lot of activity going on across the province of BC. There's a nice little ridge of high pressure that's building. But I'm going to keep my eye on this little guy right here. Come Thursday, this is going to be bringing some rain to the north coast and to the central coast and North Vancouver Island. But if I zoom in here, what that translates for us here in Metro Vancouver, that just means a few showers expected on Friday morning. And then look at this by the afternoon into the evening. Well, that's going to be clearing out quite nicely. And that is going to be setting us up for a brilliant five day forecast. You might want to put your sunglasses on for this forecast in itself because I haven't had an opportunity to put this much sun in the icons for seemingly quite a few days. And aside from that risk of showers on uh, Friday, both Saturday and Sunday, these are looking like wheel renters, temperatures into the low double digits and lots of sunshine. All right. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. In a tweet, Donald Trump calls the impeachment inquiry a lynching. The swift backlash after the break. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Get your tickets to the Hutzpah Festival today. Catch culturally diverse performances in comedy, music, theater, and dance at this one of a kind festival. And join CBC Vancouver's Mike Colleen on November 5th as he hosts this year's Power 50. He'll reveal this year's movers and shakers, according to Vancouver Magazine. For more on these events, check us out online. Well, Donald Trump has compared the impeachment inquiry being led by U.S. Democrats to a lynching. The reference is stirring up racial tensions in the U.S. As the CBC's RT Poll reports, some say it's a deliberate distraction from the actual inquiry, which heard reportedly damning testimony from a key witness today. 
Arriving to a swarm of reporters on Capitol Hill, the acting U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor, remained silent while facing a barrage of questions from reporters about communications between him and other officials on the Ukraine controversy. Did you, did you send that text to memorialize what you thought might be wrong doing? In text messages between Taylor and two other top diplomats, he raised flags about the Trump administration withholding military aid, saying, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. That is a very important statement from a very credible person. And I think that we need to understand everything that happened before he sent that text and everything that happened after. And that message became the focus of the closed door testimony today as lawmakers investigate allegations that the U.S. president withheld nearly $400 million U.S. in military aid from Ukraine in exchange for an investigation into the Ukrainian company where Joe Biden's son sat on the board. U.S. media reported late today Taylor delivered the most damaging testimony yet, confirming the allegation. Ahead of today's testimony, the U.S. president sent out a controversial tweet, a tweet some analysts called a distraction, critics called appalling. In it, Trump said all Republicans must remember what they are witnessing here, a lynching, but we will win. At least one Democratic congressman said the party is considering the possibility of a floor vote condemning the tweet, comparing the impeachment inquiry to the historic practice in the U.S. of hanging African Americans. I resent it uh, tremendously. It's far beneath the office of the President of the United States. The timeline for the impeachment probe appears to be extending as more information is being brought forth through testimony. The inquiry is expected to take at least several more weeks. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Washington. Russia's influence appears to be expanding in the Middle East following the withdrawal of U.S. troops from northern Syria and the Turkish offensive into that region. The Turkish president visited the Russian leader in Sochi today. The two countries agreed to a deal which gives Kurdish fighters based in Syria six days to move 30 kilometers away from the Turkish border. The agreement also allows Turkey and Russia to share control over many parts of the 440-kilometer-long border. The U.N. says more than 176,000 people, including nearly 80,000 children, were displaced by the Turkish offensive. Earlier this month, Turkish troops moved into northern Syria after the U.S. president abruptly decided to pull American forces out. Donald Trump's widely criticized move left Syrian Kurdish fighters who had helped defeat ISIS in the region to fend for themselves. The British Prime Minister has hit another snag in his efforts to get approval for his plan to leave the European Union by the end of this month. MPs today rejected Boris Johnson's attempt to ram his withdrawal agreement bill through Parliament. Order! Order! The eyes to the right 308, the nose to the left, 322. Johnson wanted to allow only three days of debate on the bill. Now he says he'll pause the whole procedure and see what the EU says about delaying Britain's scheduled exit. A rising Saskatchewan curler has died in childbirth. Ali Jenkins died on her 31st birthday after giving birth to a little girl. Bonnie Allen has more on Jenkins' life and on maternal deaths in Canada. Allie Jenkins was a fierce competitor. Three. I just so you can see here she's handling the pressure. She was admired for her dedication to curling and to her young family. On Sunday, Jenkins gave birth to a baby girl, then died from a rare complication in which amniotic fluid seeps into the bloodstream and the heart fails the lungs collapse. The unexpected nature makes things very difficult, uh, but also what a great person that Allie was. Dr. Jennifer Blake says the cause of amniotic fluid embolism is unknown and unpreventable. The rate is around 1 in 20,000 births. That sounds pretty rare until you think that in a city of Toronto, for example, you'd have well over 20,000 births in a year. 
And it's often fatal. A mother's only hope for survival is life-saving measures by medical staff. Blake says the country needs a better way to track and reduce all maternal deaths during childbirth. I don't think most Canadians realize that we don't have the system to get the data. She believes if that happened, more deaths could be prevented. Back in Saskatoon, Ellie Jenkins' teammates and friends are reeling. I didn't want to believe it because honestly, Ali is such a strong person. Like she, she was such a force. Curling community has lost a great one. She brought it every time. They're raising money to support her husband, Scott, and their three children, including Jenkins' newborn daughter, Sydney, who is still in intensive care. I think she's a little fighter, and I think she gets that a lot from her mom. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. It has long been the idea for the future, the dream of urban flights. We'll take you to Singapore next, where that vision is coming closer to reality. Wednesday on the early edition, our Metro Matters reporter Justin McElroy joins us to tell us what a liberal minority government could mean for major infrastructure projects in the Lower Mainland. That's tomorrow on the early edition. Well, an electric helicopter, yes, an electric helicopter could soon replace a downtown taxi ride if a German company's plans work out. They got approval from officials in Singapore to do a test flight in the heart of the city. Take a look at what they are calling the bolicopter. Today's test flight was um, truly a milestone forward uh, for the introduction of urban air mobility. You know, from what the outset might look like a short flight, actually this was the first time that a National Civil Aviation Authority actually allowed a piloted flight to happen at such an iconic scene in the heart of a megacity. 
there's a great need to revolutionize mobility because simply with what we've done in the past, we're not going to co uh, counter you know, this whole urbanization trend, the pollution that's coming along with it and so on. So we're in great need of solutions. I think several decades down the road, absolutely, this may even be the dominant uh, mode of transportation, but who knows where this will actually lead us. We are here because we're absolutely convinced we are now ready to take the first step and we invite everybody to come along with us and then explore on how far this can take us. Okay, so replacing taxis, where are all of these things going to land? How are they all going to battle out for airspace? Wow, you got a lot of questions. I know. Well, they were good questions, then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you need air traffic control going on down there. Wow. I guess we'll see. Yeah. Not here anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That is it for tonight's show. Um, we are leaving you with pictures from yes. the election last night. The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, all of it last night during our federal election. Have a great night.